So good to see all of you here today. I feel like we're finally getting a, a handle on this virus thing. Yes, yes. Things are taking some semblance of, of how I remember life used to be. Fellowship. <laughs> yes. Thank you for mentioning that. And now I'll move on. So, <laughs> yes, we have talked about that. We've talked about reinstituting fellowship. As you can see, we have a giant TV in the other room. Did you guys notice that? Yeah. So that's going to be our overflow room, and it's for those of us who uh, might be afraid to sit in a, in a more confined space, even though we're separated by six feet and all that. Some people are still afraid. And so now we have the overflow. So you can actually watch the service from the other room if you wanted to. Or if you have a child that you haven't brought their straitjacket, you can always go in there. <laughs> and, uh, and so that will, be, that will be the overflow room. And the next thing will be Sunday school and fellowship. So we'll be sticking around for a while after church and talking about that. If any of you are interested in Sunday school and teaching the children, please see me. Um, and we have a couple of other changes going on, but we'll let you know as that goes on. Well, we're in the middle of March, and we're in the book of Romans, chapter 12. We're going to pick up from verse 9 to 21. So uh, these are the verses I wasn't able to get to last week because I care for you. <laughs> I didn't want to wear you out. There's nothing worse than somebody wearing you out and overstaying their welcome. And so that's why that big clock is on the back wall. I try to keep my eyes on it. Before we get started, let's just pray and ask the Lord's favor. Good morning, Father. We come before you as your people, those that you've called by name, into your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the grace and forgiveness that we have, not because we've earned it or we deserve it, not because we're your best choice, but because of your mercy. And I pray that you help us, Lord, to receive it today as your spirit speaks to each one of our hearts as we look into your word, that word that will endure forever because it talks of you. I pray that you might help us to understand it and to put into place those things, Lord, that we need to incorporate into our lives. I pray that you might help us now in our minds and hearts to submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in chapter 12. I picked verse 20 as being a focused verse today. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, Give him a drink, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. That's right. I want, to, I want you to have a big, giant burn mark on the top of your head. We're going to talk about that. If uh, The previous verses, we talked about the body of Christ in, in chapter 12. We're now going to move on to how the body of Christ, Christ operates, and so I called it bodybuilding, and it's not the, you know, this kind of bodybuilding. It's the body of Christ building. So just so that you know, we're in chapter 12, talking about church life, the very application of all the spiritual truths that we've gone on to. If you remember, we did verses 1 and 2, some, some of the best verses you'll find in the Bible. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we talked about that a couple of weeks ago and just went over those two verses. Last week, we spoke about the differing gifts and how God has created us to be the body of Christ. The very hands and feet of Jesus are here in this place today, and that's who we are. He says, through the grace that has been given me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So we should have a, a proper assessment of who we are and what we can do. As we have many members in one body, but not all the members have the same functions, such as hands, feet, kidney. It, it, hopefully you have all those. So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And we spoke about these seven primary motivational gifts that are mentioned here. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. That's speaking forth God's word, 
usually bringing conviction. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. So we're to use faith in our ministry. Ministering is basically serving somebody's physical need, uh, like my wife does where she goes down and ties my shoe, and I didn't even ask her to, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Service to somebody else, taking care of a physical need that someone else has, that's ministry. It's not, uh, it's not what I do, although they, they call me a pastor and a minister, but we are the ministers, actually. We are the ones who do the serving. So that's the gift of serving. He who teaches in teaching, and you guys know the whole didactic of what it is to take information to break it down into smaller, understandable pieces so that you go, oh, I think I'll remember that. That's teaching. He who exhorts in his exhortation, that's more of a counseling gift, a coming alongside and encouraging, trying to take the word of God and apply it to a custom situation that somebody might have. Uh, that is the gift of exhortation. He who gives with liberality. So if your gift happens to be giving, you usually have the gift of making as well, or you'll be shortchanged. So giving with liberality. So we're encouraged, if that is your gift, give liberally. He who leads with diligence, because you might have the ability to lead, but if you don't step out and actually become diligent about taking steps to activate those things, you will, you will self-destruct. You know what it is to say, you know, they, on Sunday, they really shouldn't do that. They should do this. And it would be better if the lights weren't the way they are. And, if they, and you know, the seats could be better arranged. You'd get 15% more capacity in here. It's still having six feet distance. And you know what else they should do? If you have the gift of leadership and suddenly you see the big picture and you see all these changes that could be made to make everybody better and you don't do anything about it, you know what happens? You become a critic. <laughs> they wouldn't do it that way. I wouldn't do it that way. So using the gifts, God gives us these gifts and these abilities and these understandings to use them for the, for the good of all because the gift isn't given to you for you, for you to show off. The gift is given for the benefit of other people. Amen? All right. So I want to know what your gifts are because I, I kind of, no. <laughs> Giving with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Mercy is the ability to carry someone else's pain where you feel what they feel and these folks will come alongside and they will weep with you when you weep and they will rejoice with you when you rejoice and they are basically a mirror of what you're doing emotionally and what's happening. And my goodness, how tender and how wonderful are people with this gift. All of these are characteristics which Jesus had, which we saw last week. All of these are characteristics in which we should all be growing in, but there are certain things where God just builds into your mainframe who you are. It is your motivational gift. It's how you see everything in life. Uh, if, if you have the gift of giving, you think, you know what? I, I see we need to get some money into that department because, you know, we, we need it. So let me write the check and take care of that. Somebody who has the gift of mercy looks for somebody who's sorrowful and says, hey, man, I noticed that you're, you're kind of down. Are you all right? Let's pray together. Let's talk. What's going on? And you begin to talk about those things, and, and uh, you'll see people crying together and hugging together and praying together. That's, that is the gift of mercy, of which I am doing my best to enlarge my heart to get there. But it might be a while. <laughs> so as we move on, you'll notice there's the explaining the word portion, and there's the expanding the work portion. So those on the bottom, ministry, giving, leading, and mercy are all about growing the work. And if you look at the top ones, prophecy, teaching, and exhortation, it's all about explaining the word of God. So you're explaining the word of God or you're serving other people. It, it breaks into that. And then we get into the rest of the verses we didn't cover last week. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, <laughs> serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Ignore that. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. We call that arrogance. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I've broken this down into 32 little separate exhortations, and I'm going to do my best to go through them thoroughly enough that you understand them, and yet I don't want to beat you to death because I could preach a sermon on any one of these verses, and I don't want to do that. So I call this bodybuilding because within the context of chapter 12, it says that we're not to be, trans we're, we're not to be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then he says God has given us all these gifts, and this is what it looks like to use these gifts. So this is why I call it bodybuilding because it's actually the body of Christ, building up the body of Christ. Uh, maybe not like this. <laughs> but it's building up the body of Christ and saying, okay, now that you know you're not supposed to be conformed to the world, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and God has given you all these abilities, this is what it looks like to exercise them. This is what it looks like in the body of Christ for you to do them. Let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, nobody wants love without, uh, with hypocrisy, right? You know, Somebody, somebody comes up to you, you, you know, and you say, hey, how you doing? Are they, I'm good. And then they walk away sad. You don't believe a word they say, right? You know, they might have been being kind to you by not dumping their dirty laundry on you, but that's hypocritical, isn't it? Anyway, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Do you know a good Christian hates I know you don't hear that message often. A good Christian hates evil. Otherwise, if you don't hate it, you, you're going to be wearing it. <laughs> you're going to be living it. You're going to be doing it. Truth without love is brutality. And love without truth is hypocrisy. I say this all the time because I, I think it's so true. Truth without love is brutality. If, if you just speak the truth to somebody and, and you don't really care about them, you know, you're doing like a Kramer. You're just going to give them the truth and you don't care how it falls on them and how they receive it or whether they receive it or not. I used to be one of those people because I thought truth was the most important thing and if you can't handle the truth, there's something wrong with you. You can't handle the truth. It's not my problem. But it may have something to do with the way I administered the truth without love and without a concern for them, a love for the truth but not a love for the person. And you have to have both, right? Because if I go, man, why are you wearing that? You are way too old to be wearing that. <laughs> Don't do it. You, you know, it might be the truth, but it's not going over well. And if you want to be heard and if you really want, if you care for people, if you love people, you'll take that into consideration. So you don't want to be hypocritical by just giving people the sledgehammer and, and you're not going to give them the salve, you know. So it says in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. In other words, as we all exercise our gifts with this balance of understanding, if you're a prophet, you're probably light on love. If you have the gift of mercy, you're probably big on love, but maybe short on truth. 
You know, the person that says, I don't know, I'm always sick and I don't know why. And you say, oh, I feel so bad for you. Or you could say, I feel really bad for you. I wonder if you stop smoking, if that would help. <coughs> I'm just saying, you know. You know, you, you want to mix the two together. And you might have a propensity to go off in one direction, but you have to realize that there's, there's another direction that you yourself are not gifted with. And I have to realize this all the time, and that's why God gave me a loving wife. She used to be much more loving. <laughs> now she is much more truth-loving, and I have become more compassionate. Yes, I have. You haven't seen me before, so don't make judgments. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth. I hate, God says. God has hate for sin because it destroys people. It kills people. I, I don't know if you've known anybody that's in the depths of um, a drug addiction, but it, it, your heart goes out to them and you, you absolutely hate the thing that's destroying their lives. I don't know if you've seen anybody. My father died of alcoholism. Uh, he destroyed his body from the inside out and watched him die. When you see something like that, it's, it's sad, but it makes you angry. You're like, what a waste of a human life. You can hate evil. Just don't hate the people. You have to hate the evil or, or you'll, you'll say, yeah, it's okay. You know, if you want to do crack every day, it's okay. You know, if, if you are lax about evil, you'll end up doing it. So you have to hate it, but you don't hate the people. You love the people. You feel bad for the people. You want to reach in and try to help those people. But it's, it's just a heart-rending experience because there's this tug in two directions. I don't know if you feel it. I feel it all the time. I'm, I'm addressing somebody, and they're saying, yeah, I'm really struggling. You know, I'm living with my boyfriend, you know. And Okay, I can see why you're struggling. You're a Christian, right? You know the Lord. And, you know, well, why are you, why are you doing that which you understand the Scripture says you shouldn't do? Well, you know, no, I don't. Explain it to me. <laughs> you get tugged in two directions, at least I do. God hates evil. It says Proverbs 6, 16 to 17. These are six things that the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are detestable to him. A proud look. You should hate a proud look. As long as it doesn't engender you to give a proud look back. You know, somebody looks at you like this and you go, The Lord hates that. Don't do that. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. In other words, you just like to see people suffer. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to running to evil. A false witness that speaks lies. And one who sows discord among brethren. You know, like gossip. That's one of the seven things. That's one of the more acceptable, well, you know, I was trying to help them by counseling. So they told me all the evil things their husband ever did, and I don't think I'll ever forgive him. See, that's the problem. You can't unhear things, can you? That's one of the things the Lord hates, somebody that sows discord among brethren. So be careful. So no, number 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Well, that sounds like a feel-good sort of passage. I can go with that. I can almost get that tattooed on my arm. Kindly affectionate to one another as opposed to hate that which is evil. That's, uh, that's kind of a strong statement. And you'll notice that each one of these statements kind of zeroes in on a particular gift. <coughs> If, if, if you like matching games and puzzles and stuff, you can put them together. But be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. I don't know if you know these two guys, but the old cartoons, these were the goofy gophers. They, they, you know, they always spoke in the, in the, in the gopher voice or in the, in the chipmunk voice. And they were always being just going way overboard being kind to each other. You know, they would walk up to a door and, and the one would say, uh, you know, uh, open the door and say, oh, no, 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 after you. And he goes, no, 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 after you. No, no, by all means, please, you first. And like they were just constantly being so nice and trying to let the other person go. And that's a picture of what the scripture says. 
that's what you should do. You should be more thoughtful of other people instead of yourself. You know, instead of, you know, <laughs> out of my way, you know. It, it's more like, well, why don't, why don't you go first? Or, you know, we used to have fellowship, and the pizza would go really fast. Thank you, Johnsons, for doing that. But the pizza would go really fast, and people would, like, up to the front. And, you know, you, you get somebody that's, like, putting slabs of pizza on there th and walking away with a plate. And everybody behind going, like, what sort of Christian principle is that? But instead of rushing up and filling your plate, it's more like, hey, why don't you, why don't you go first, you know? Or you're, you're going up to the register and you see somebody's got one item and you got a cart full. And you go, come on, you only got one thing. No, 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 no. After you, no, oh, you're going to be waiting a long time. And you know what? I'm going to take it really long on purpose if you don't go. You twist their arm, and put them in there. To be kindly affectionate to one another. Be kindly affectionate. That means I like to be around you. I like to, I like to be in your space within six feet, you know. In brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another, Philippians says something very similar in chapter 2, 3 to 5. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's a pretty good word right there. But in lowness, lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better or worthy of better than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And of course, the famous passage where it says, you know, he, he didn't think equality with God was something to be grasped, to be held on to. And so he emptied himself and being found in the form of a man, humbled himself even to the point of death, even death on the cross. So have this mind in you because Jesus didn't think about his own welfare, he thought about ours. He sacrificed himself for us. And so he left an example for us. He didn't do it so you never have to sacrifice yourself for someone else. Well, Jesus sacrificed everything for me so I don't have to sacrifice anything. Well, that's a certain theology, but it's completely shot and it's not backed up by anything in the scriptures. So, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. In Colossians 3, 12 to 13, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. By the way, all of this is in the context of the body of Christ. It's talking about us with one another here in this place. It's not talking about us, those people out there. Oh, you've got to be really nice to those people out there. Well, of course you do, but it starts here. I don't know about you, but it, the people I have the most trouble with are the people closest to me. How about you? <laughs> Family, friends. And it's really hard to love them sometimes. How many of you marry? You married? You know what I'm talking about? Because my wife will tell you, it's tough being married to me. And for her to be kindly affectionate to me on a, on a regular basis, it takes some work. I, she's got a lot of, she's got guts. Anyway, <laughs> put on like you put on a garment. Put these things on, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. You see, the example is not, whether somebody's forgiven you, you forgive them in the same way. It's Christ, how he forgave you, that's how you should forgive everybody. So, so how, how did Christ forgive you? Was it complete? Total? When he was on the cross, he said it's finished? The telestai, it's been paid in full? Guess what? Just pre-forgive everybody. Just pre-forgive everybody, trust me. Somebody hurts your feelings or says something, just say, hey, I was expecting that. I forgive you already. <laughs> well, what do you mean? I didn't even apologize. It doesn't matter. I forgive you anyway. Well, why do I need forgiveness? Well, you hurt my feelings, but that's okay because I pre-forgave you. I'm telling you, it's, it's a good, put that in your pocket and take it home. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, 
be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. If each one of us considered the other person more important than ourselves, that's the way it's supposed to be. Because I never have to worry about my own needs because all of you are concerned with them. Why would I have to, Pastor, can I get you some water? Can I get you something to eat? Are you tired? Do you need a massage? You know, like, <laughs> I'm good. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right. And if I, was always, if I was always interested in what's going on in your life and how I can pray for you and how I can reach, is there something that you need? You, you got something that needs to be remodeled? I can, I can help with that. I have a screw gun. You know, like, if we were always doing that to one another, there wouldn't be any needs, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And then what we do is we take this completeness and we move out into the rest of the world in these concentric circles. That's the way we're supposed to be. But if you don't put this on, and it's a decision, you put on this kindly affection towards one another. You don't do that, then you're just going to do it out of, well, you know, pastor got this whole program where we got to think of other people. You know, and, and there's no love in that, right? And there's hypocrisy in that. So, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Did you know, ladies, that's the number one soul cry of a man is honor. Did you know that? Respect. That's why women don't watch The Godfather. It's not part of their thing. But, the, but men, it's like, a, it's like respect, that whole thing. Anyway, I talk too much. Next, verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord. Fervent. It's not a word that we use very often. It means fired up. It means boiling, actually. It's the, the original Greek word means to be boiling over. You know, when you, oh, I forgot the pot on the stove thing. That's, that's what we're to be. Like so excited about Jesus, so happy and so in love with the Lord and with other people that it just comes boiling out of you. It got quiet that day. <laughs> King James uses the word sloth. And you might think of this lovely animal. But it says not lagging in, they're not being slothful in, in not neglecting diligence, not to be slothful. You ever see one of these things move? It's, it's frustrating to watch because they're like, <laughs> not diligent at all, just slow and whatever. Anyway, not lagging in diligence, not being slothful, not being neglectful, not being lame, not going half measures, not saying, ah, I don't feel like doing that. Not that at all. But being fervent in spirit, which is to be fired up. And if you want an example of that, Jesus prayed in the garden and he prayed with such fervor and he was so conflicted between what his physical human body was saying and what his spirit was crying out to God and saying he sweat drops of blood out of his skin that's fervent that's fiery that's putting your whole heart mind strength into it that's what we're supposed to be doing here in this place for one another I don't know about you I just don't work that hard but I'm going to try harder. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. If you remember the woman that came at Jesus' feet and she began to weep on his feet and clean his feet with her hair, that's a person that was all in, right? It's, uh, it's like the thing I remember. When you have breakfast and you have steak and eggs, you could say that the chicken was involved, but the cow gave it all. <laughs> and that's what it's talking about. It's not talking about, it's just what it is. And she, she gave it all. I mean, she was there washing the feet of Jesus and she gave it all. And that's how we're to serve is to be all in. 
And I don't know if you've ever washed stinky feet, but it's, you know, some people have a weird thing about feet, but it's, it's not the place you want to go necessarily, but she did that, and then she wiped his feet with her hair. You, could you be any more all in? And that's what we're supposed to be doing for one another. Jesus, when he washed the disciples' feet, it's interesting, he waited until after dinner. Everybody ate, and they're on these little low tables with their feet in one another's face, and nobody washed their feet. You, you think washing your hands, you know, and singing happy birthday is a big deal. I mean, you got your feet in somebody's face as they're trying to eat. And, you know, they're on these little low coffee table height tables. Jesus waits until after the meal. He takes off his outer garment and he straps a towel on himself and he starts washing the disciples' feet, which is like, wow, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> you know, I find the amazing thing, it never says who washed Jesus' feet. And I wonder if it ever happened. But you see, by washing one another's feet, we wash the feet of Jesus because we're the body of Christ. That's the kind of fervent ministry. By the way, that's the gift of ministry. That's the gift of service, if you will. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. It couldn't be clearer. If you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ and you know that he died for you and forgave you of your sins, there's been a transformation in you and you have a new heart and a new mind. When that happens, you naturally begin to love other people. Of course, you got that old programming that's got to be rewritten and you need some patches, like every day. But you have a new nature and there's going to be stuff coming out of you from your new nature that's different. And this is what it looks like. It's to be all in. It's to be fervent, not slothful, not, yeah, I'll get around to that when I get, but fervent. I think of the Good Samaritan. You know, there were people walking on the road, religious leaders, high, you know, uh, a Levite, and this Samaritan, somebody of questionable background. And there was this man on the side of the road who had been jumped and mugged and, and robbed and left for dead. And this person that, in the story, Jesus knew that they would have a questionable mind about whether this person was authentic or God-fearing or, or, or caring at all. They're the one that stops, not the religious leader, not the one who's headed to, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to church. I can't stop for the, the guy on the side of the road who had an accident. Hey, man, I'll pray for you. you know, and That's not fervent love. Fervent love is you, you get off your mount. You go and see what goes on. You bound up. He, he binds up all of his wounds, puts them on his own animal, and takes them to the nearest, you know, Motel 8 and puts them up. And he tells the manager, listen, he needs to rest and recuperate and I'll, I'll leave money here for his room. But also, I'm going to give you some money for his care. But if he needs anything else, when I come back, I'll pay you. That's fervent love for somebody. When a stranger is on the side of the road and you stop to help them and you go to that extreme to care for them like they're your own, that's what's supposed to be happening here. That's church life. And when the world does not see that, they have no concern for whatever message it is that you give them because they don't see it. But you do this and you won't need to say a word. Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says, And the king will answer them and say, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus says that he is going to judge us at the end of all time, and as we come before him, he's going to separate the people as he separates the sheep from the goats. And he's going to put the sheep on his right, and he's going to put the goats on his left, and he's going to say, You, welcome. I can't even say it without crying. Enter into the kingdom of your father. Because you know what? There were all these things that you were doing, which is a revelation that there's been a change. And the goats, they didn't do all that stuff, which is a revelation of their nature. And he says, in that you do these things, you do it to me. Jesus says, if you love another person, you're loving me. If you have the right motive, you're not doing it for a performance. You're not doing it for an Emmy. 
you're doing it for the Lord. And he says, when you do it for them, you do it for me. And that really helps me because honestly, a lot of you all are not just worthy of anything. <laughs> and I'm not. But when I know that the Lord is, and I, I'm able to serve you, if you can spit in my face and call me names and kick me in the shins and call me Karen, I don't care. I can still love you because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the Lord. And when I do it to you, I do it for Jesus. You see how much easier that is? You know, I don't, if, if I have a problem with anything, I just have to remember I'm doing it for the Lord. And when that happens, it's like, okay, I could do anything. I could put up with anything. And so could you. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. It just sounds like a to-do list, doesn't it? It just, it, okay, I got to do, I got to have fervent prayer, patient in tribulation. Yeah, it's on my to-do list. I'll, I'll take care of that, Pastor Dave. I think about John as he ran to the tomb and he looked in the tomb and it says when he saw the empty tomb, he believed. Peter came roaming up behind him because he was probably built more like me and doesn't run. And he barges into the tomb and looks around and he supposed that the soldiers came and stole the body of Jesus. But John stops at the opening and he looks in and he goes, aha, and he believed. That's what it is to be rejoicing in hope. We have a picture of that in John at the tomb. Being patient, patient in tribulation. We've got a guy named Job who had all sorts of suffering and you can see his theological standpoint through everything sustained him in what he knew about God. He got to the point where he was fed up with it and he wanted to get out of it, like COVID might be for you. But this guy had way bigger problems. He lost everything, his family all of his possessions, except for his friends, which gave him some really bad advice. And his wife, who said, just curse God and die. You want to be patient in tribulation, you can read the book of Job and look what Job went through and look how God rewarded him at the end of his life. It's very encouraging. If you want to know about continuing steadfastly in prayer, Elijah, it says in James, that he prayed and for three and a half years it didn't rain. And then he prayed again. And after that three and a half years, it rained. That's being steadfast in prayer. So we have examples throughout the scripture of people doing these things. And that's what it is to be a Christian, really. And also taking care of distributing to the needs of the saints. To feed the hungry and to help those in trouble. And then your light will shine out from the darkness and your darkness around you will be as bright as noon. It says in Isaiah 58:10 about caring for one another's needs. By the way, that's the gift of ministry. That's the gift of serving right there, taking care of one another's needs. And given to hospitality. Hospitality isn't having somebody over for cake and donuts. You know, that's not hospitality. The actual word hospitality comes from this word, philoxeno which is philo, which is brotherly love, and xenia, which is stranger. So it's a love of strangers. That's what hospitality is. It's a love of strangers. It's what we see in the Good Samaritan story, a love of strangers. On Sunday morning, everybody comes in and somebody walks in that we don't know. Hey, who's that? And you smother them because you love strangers. That's what practicing hospitality is. You love strangers. And you know what? It's not easy sometimes, especially for some of us, some of us, some of you who are shy. I used to be shy. I'm not shy. I'm over it. But being a lover of strangers is what we're to do. And that's how we exercise that gift. And there is the gift of hospitality. There are people that will love to have you come into their house, not to show off their decorations, not to show off how beautifully they live, not to, you know, boast of their possessions or, you know, their higher echelon than you in the financial strata of life. But it's more about serving you and helping you and anything that's theirs is yours. That's hospitality. 
Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Yeah, this is easy. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. By the way, he's talking about in the body of Christ. He's not talking about out there. People are, my boss, you don't know my boss. No, he's talking about in here, which tells me in the body of Christ, you're going to have stuff like this that happens. And by the way, if you don't know about it, that's cool. We did a good job of keeping it under, under wraps. But it's happening. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That, by the way, is an encouragement for the rest of us to be like the people who have the gift of mercy, who weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Because people like this guy right here can be very difficult to be kind to. And yet the scripture says that we're to bless and bless those who persecute you. And it's an amazing thing because it actually makes a difference in the other person's life if you're able to do that. The scripture tells us here in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I don't know about you, but I don't like being used. You know, you don't hear from somebody for a year and a half and they go, hey, how you doing, man? And I'm like, good, what do you need? <laughs> because I'm being used. They need money. I know. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much you need? Well, you know, uh, how you doing? Uh, you don't care, you know. I hate being used. You like being used? What am I supposed to do to those people? Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So you might look like Jesus. That he makes his sun rise in the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. You know, God does good to everybody equally. You know, it doesn't just rain on your house, regardless of what the monsters did. It doesn't just rain in one. It rains universally, right? And that's the way God gives grace universally. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? So there's a reward also involved. Do not even, th do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, you know, your little clique, your little clan, then what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Tax collectors are friends with other tax collectors. The IRS is a nice tight-knit group of hitmen. Therefore, you shall be perfect. It means complete, mature, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if you want to be well-rounded, learn to love your enemies. You want to show maturity? Love your enemies. That shows real maturity of character, doesn't it? Because you can't just manufacture that. Somebody's, you know, freaking out on you, and you're like, mm -hmm. I'll get you. No, go ahead. What else you got? You know, you can't. You could try to fake it. It just doesn't work. And it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is what it looks like. And weep with those who weep. Yeah, that's the gift of mercy. Somebody's moaning out. Yes. But that's what the scripture tells us to do. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. It's a checklist again of things. Be of the same mind toward one another. We already went over what it is to have that same mind. I'm supposed to be thinking about you. You're supposed to be thinking about me. But as soon as I, I do something for you and you don't reciprocate, what do I do? Hey, did you get that Christmas card I sent you? Oh, you did? Okay. Because you didn't say thank you or I didn't get a card from you. So that's the subtext, you know. And it happens. That's what happens. Listen, we're in a three-legged race. I have to be mindful of you because we're all linked together. We're the body of Christ. And we're all a part of one another. It's like a three-legged race. If I decide I'm going to take off in a certain direction and I don't let you know and you're not keeping step with me, what's going to happen? Down on your face. 
So I don't ever want to do that. And I've been guilty of doing that in the past. If, if you're going to go off in a certain direction or you have needs or, or desires or thoughts and you don't use your spiritual gift and you're not contributing to the whole, you're just going to be miserable. You know what it is to feel bad for somebody, but don't go talk to them or pray for them. And you just let that fester inside of you or see that somebody has a need or just to see a stinking piece of paper on the floor. You see a piece of paper on the floor and you go, there's a piece of paper on the floor. Somebody put that there. I'm going to see how long it takes for somebody to see it and pick it up. It'll make you a miserable person. You become a critic. Anyway, forgive me. Pre-forgive me. <laughs> Philippians 2, 1 to 3 says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, there's tremendous consolation in Christ. If there's any comfort of love, we are super comforted by love. If there's any fellowship of the Spirit, and we have lots of fellowship of the Spirit. If there's any affection and mercy, and I can tell you there's a lot of affection and mercy, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one accord and one mind. In other words, don't be the one that's always got to be contrary. Hey, wouldn't this be a good idea? I don't think so. Why not? I don't know. Give me a couple minutes. <laughs> because it's just your nature to be contrary. Be of one mind, which means we all kind of have to bend to the middle, don't we? Trust me, we do. Trust me, you're not responding, so I'm wondering if you're thinking about that. We need to learn how to compromise, not the truth, but to compromise our opinions, our willfulness, and we need to kind of lean into one another. And if you've, if you've never been in a leadership meeting, then you don't know what that is, but, uh, or maybe you do. Or if you've ever been in a meeting with a bunch of other people and you know somebody comes up with this great idea, but it's half-baked because it hasn't gone around the room and been refined yet. Everybody kind of needs to lean to the middle. Your, your ideas are not like your children where you think they're the best and you defend them at all costs. Be of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's called humility, let each esteem others better than himself. You see, I consider, I, I want to hear what my wife has to say. And every Sunday I go home, I say, so, how was the sermon? She goes, okay. I was pouring my heart out. What do you mean, okay? <laughs> She'll say, you kind of repeated yourself a lot. Oh, I did. Okay. You go up one morning. You try to, no. That was all right. <laughs> I really want to hear what she has to say because she sits there and I, I'm up here. I don't really know what the heck's going on up here. I have to like go back to the recording and go, wow, I really did that, huh? I have a really bad habit of doing that, don't I? I need to cut that out. You, when you esteem other people more important and you, you really value their opinion and you have your catcher's mitt on, you know, because they may burn one over the plate, be ready for it. We should be ready for that. In loneliness of mind, considering others more important and their views and their opinions because they have something to throw into the, the kitty, don't they? So that's what we do. There's a homeless guy here who has a sign that says, Seeking human kindness. The scripture says, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Jesus did this all the time. The dregs of society, prostitutes, tax collectors, lepers, the people that were left on the side of the road who spent their life in the dust at other people's feet being ignored. Those are the people Jesus reached out to all the time, including me including you. And so we should associate with the humble. Don't, you know, don't, you know, you know. <laughs> this is a picture of a, a New York City police officer giving a homeless man his boots. It was caught on video. It wasn't staged. It was caught. This guy had compassion on his, it was on his beat, and he noticed this guy didn't have shoes for days. And he went over and he was moved in his heart and he just took his boots off and gave it to him. That's the kind of thing that shows the world that you know Jesus when you're willing to do that kind of thing. That's the gift of giving, by the way, coupled with mercy. Anyway, 
verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceable, peaceably with all men. I like that verse. But let's do the other one. Do not repay evil for evil. You guys, you, you know, because you've been educated, Bugs Bunny has told us all. You know, you, you poke somebody in the eye and they crack you with a bat and then you pull out a gun and then you get an anvil and drop it on their head and then they get a piano from the third floor and drop it on you. We understand what this means, right? Because it's our tendency to get back at people because I want you to know how bad you hurt me. Maybe you need to listen to me squawk at you for an hour. Don't do it because it doesn't help somebody. What it does is it just throws fuel in the fire because believe it or not, in an argument, one person is gasoline and the other person's fire. So you could throw your fire in a gasoline, it won't work out well. You could throw your gasoline in a fire, it won't work out well. Don't return evil for evil because it never comes to any good at all. Have regard for good things. What it means is, Always be looking for good things to do. That's what it means. Be a person who's looking for good things to do. You know, when I told you about the piece of paper on the floor, I bet you guys were looking at the floor. I wonder, <laughs> wonder if he's talking about a real piece of paper. Looking, somebody with the gift of mercy should be looking around for people who need a, a listening ear and somebody to pray with them and be merciful. People who have the gift of teaching should find people that need to learn. People with the gift of exhortation or, or encouragement need to find people who need courage. And if, and if we're always doing that and fortifying one another, then the body of Christ will be complete and mature and will grow up into becoming that we look like Jesus Christ when people walk in this place. That makes sense, right? And as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I love that. Because it says there might be a place where you can't live at peace with everybody. How many of you know that that's true? But as far as it lies within you, I think of an episode of The Office where um, there was this whole thing and Jim is talking to Pam on the phone and he says, listen, they're going to shut this whole thing down. They're going to shut down this whole business venture and Dwight's going to get fired. And, uh, but he doesn't know it yet, but I do. <laughs> and, and she says, well, did you try to tell him? And he goes, I tried. And she says, but, th but did he didn't listen to you? No, he didn't listen to you. Well, you, you should try again. And he goes, listen, I tried. And she asks this question, did you try your hardest? And that's the end of the phone call. And the next thing you see, Jim goes over and he tackles him. <laughs> and he locks him in a closet. That's what it is to try your hardest. You see, so as far as it lies within you, live at peace with all men. As far as it lies within you. Have you tried your hardest? Have you tried your hardest? That question comes up in my mind, and I go, I think I could dig a little deeper. I think I'd dig a lot deeper. Living at peace with all men, making it a priority, and especially in the body of Christ, hugely important. Last slide. I'm lying. Verse 19, beloved, do not take, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath. Give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Because that whole face-to-face -face gun, anvil, piano, it never resolves anything. But you can overcome evil with good. And if you're walking in the Spirit, and if you guys have had any time in Christ Jesus, you know when the Spirit of God touches you and you're willing to submit yourself to his leading, somebody could be yelling and screaming in your face, and you can be like, like water on a fire with soft words and love and concern for the other person who's freaking out in your face. And just say, I, I'm not going to become like you. I'm not going to reflect you. I'm going to reflect Jesus Christ. And it makes all the difference in a, in a problem like that. So don't avenge yourselves. These are the avengers. 
And, you know, it might make good good movies, you know, getting back at the bad guys and, you know, taking them down and destroying everything. And Don't do it in a relationship. Relationships are much more fragile than anything you see on TV. Matthew 5, 38 to 42, Jesus' teaching says this, You have heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. <coughs> Excuse me. By the way, somebody knocks your tooth out, don't go trying to take their teeth out. It's not a good idea. If somebody punches in the eye, don't punch them in the eye. That's what Jesus is saying. That was written actually in the Old Testament. That was a Mosaic law. And it was there so that people would know how to judge in a court when you know somebody lost something or somebody gained something. You need to recompense in equal measure what the person lost. Not, hey, I burned myself with a cup of coffee from McDonald's and so I get a million dollars. You see, that was not in the law anywhere. So this is basically a guideline. Make sure that you're you know, equitable with returning. And so that's, but people took it personally that they could take personal vengeance on somebody. If somebody slugged me, I'm going to slug you back. But it usually happened to be with a bit more force. And then, of course, that person resents it, and then they get an anvil. And, you know, so Jesus said, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil, per an evil person. Yeah, don't do that. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. In other words, somebody sues you and wants your shirt, give him your jacket. And whoever compels you to go one mile, because the Jews occupied by Rome very often were walked up to and a Roman soldier would say, hey, carry my pack. And they wrote it into law that you had to go with them for one mile. So if somebody wants you to go a mile and forces you to go a mile, go with them too. You see, you're not resisting an evil person. You say, all right, 29, 30, that's it. This is, I'm drawing a line, take your pack back. You see, that's what we would do in the flesh. But he said, don't do it. Give him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Ow. I have a whole garage full of tools, and I have loaned them out, and you know what happens? Bye-bye. And you know why it hurts me? Because I actually think I'll get it back. I'm a fool. Not them. If you're going to give something away, just wave goodbye. If it ever comes back, you're like, oh, cool. I totally forgot you had that because I pre-forgived you for taking it. <laughs> that's, how, that's how it works, I'm telling you. So I have a garage full of tools. I just told you that, right? And I already have some on loan. Uh, we have a commitment here this morning. So uh, if you'd like to get in line, let me know. And, you know, I have nail guns. and Anyway. From the one who wants to borrow from you, don't turn away. And you know why? Because it separates you from your stuff. And then you have to trust the Lord. And it's for the betterment of the other person, and even if they keep it, it doesn't matter. Sometimes instead of, hey, can you loan me? Why don't I just give it to you? It would be better for both of us. <laughs> Honestly, just let it go. You, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a better thing for both parties. It says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, which means providing for their basic necessities. For in so doing, you heap coals of fire in his head. <laughs> oh, 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 that's right. Kill him with kindness. You want something from me? Here you go. <laughs> Choke on it, you know. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way my dear mother explained to me this verse. You kill them with kindness but it doesn't match in the context because here's the context if they're hungry feed them if they're thirsty give them a drink and then you throw coals of fire in their head that doesn't match what would happen is if you were home and you had a, 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 a fireplace that was your cooking that was your light that was your heat it was everything your fireplace goes out it's a big deal to start a fire. I have a wood stove at home and I have all the modern conveniences like aiming flames and stuff, and it's still a lot of work. 
So what would happen is if your furnace went down, essentially the thing that you cook on, the light, and, you know, everything, you go to your neighbor and say, listen, can I grab some coals from your furnace because I'm out. And so they would take them, put them in a jar, and ladies would typically carry them on her head. And so they would fill up a jar with all of these hot coals, and they'd say, hey, thanks a lot. And, you know, you might not be getting along with that neighbor, but you're forced to go to them and say, hey, uh, I kind of have a need. Um, could you help me out? And the person in the house, you'd be like, sure, come on in. What do you need? Can I make you a cup of coffee? You know, and give them what they need, and then they think, oh, guess what? You just built a bridge. And what you did is you heaped coals of fire upon their head, and then they went home, and they were able to relight their furnace. You know, if you do that for other people, you will relight their furnace. They're cold, hard, dark, hungry. You can bring light to their life if you do that. And you heap coals of fire upon their head. Give to him who asks of you, and whoever wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I've seen it time and time again in other situations, but also in situations with myself when I have put my own reputation, my own dignity, my own emotions aside and said, Lord, what's more important is that I look like you, I talk like you, I shine for you. And that's hugely important. And God does a tremendous work then. Let God in and don't take wrath for yourself. Leave room for God's wrath. God will take care of it. I've seen it over and over and over. The Lord takes care of those things. When you think you're going to go in and I'm going to fix this, you're just going to make a bigger mess. Trust in the Lord and allow him to fix it because he does a much better job than you and I ever would. Amen? Amen. Two things to leave with you. I thought it was the last slide. I did. John chapter 12, verses 23 to 26 says, But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's speaking of his sacrifice on the cross. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world, in other words, disregards it and counts it as secondary, will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will also be, be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. There's a promise that Jesus just gave to us, that if we follow him, that there's a promise of eternity. And, you know, who in the world wants to live any other way anyway? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8 says, But I say this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. In other words, whatever you plant in the ground, that's what's coming up. If you put a couple seeds in the ground, you're going to get a couple of plants. If you put a ton of seeds in the ground, you get lots of plants. It's uh, even business people know this. We'll sow bountifully, we'll also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. In other words, it's not a burden. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Did you get the superlatives in that? Every all. You see, you put out for God and you do those things that the Lord puts upon your heart and he's going to take care of your needs. He's going to give you everything that you need to handle that situation. So add to your gift through faith, this outpouring of what the Lord would have you do, and he'll be with you and he'll bless you in that. It's an amazing thing to be part of the body of Christ and to know that God loved us so much that he died in our place so that we might have this life and we might be able to do all this stuff without which I would not have the power. You know, it's like buying a toy for your kid without a battery. Yeah, that's wonderful. What's it do? Nothing. That's what our lives are without the power of God, without being born again. I thank you guys for your patience. Mm -hmm.